welcome to the NATIS webinar for uh, December. Um, we thank you for joining our uh, e-seminar today. Uh, the topic is uses of TCD and continuous monitoring. My name is Katie Volrath, and I'm the TCD clinical specialist with NATIS Medical. I'm proud to be hosting today's session in conjunction with our education team. In a moment, I'm going to introduce you to our speaker and presenter, Donna Lee Davis. But first, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being broadcast across the internet, which means the presentation can be heard through your internet speakers. At this point, I'd like to introduce our speaker. I've known Donna Lee Davis for many years and have the greatest respect for her as a clinical nurse specialist as well as a TCD technologist with vast clinical TCD knowledge and experience. Donna Lee began her career in vascular ultrasound in 1986. She then worked for 12 years as the director of the Cerebral Vascular Laboratory at the Cleveland Clinic. I had the privilege of working with Donna Lee for a number of years after that when she was one of the TCD clinical specialists with Nicolay Biomedical. Currently, she is the director of education for her own company, TCD Education. Donna Lee has earned her stellar reputation as a TCD expert, having presented multiple talks at conferences and uh, sessions, seminars, and specialty courses. She is well published and has many poster presentations, both domestically and internationally. We're proud to welcome Donna Lee today as she educates us on the many uses of TCD monitoring. Welcome, Donna Lee. I'm going to hand the presentation over to you. And folks on the webinar, there may be a slight uh, delay as Donna Lee begins her session. Thank you, and here's Donna Lee. Thanks, Katie. I'm just going to spend just two seconds here uploading a video that I would like to use later on in the program. It will be helpful to you. So if you just give me a minute, I want to upload these videos. There's nothing like a uh, video to make a presentation go very well, and it should show up there. Yeah, it did. Okay, again, I apologize for this, but we couldn't get this to work earlier for some reason. And then we're going to begin, and hopefully the painful part will all be over. Okay. All right, so today's topic is um, transcranial Doppler monitoring. Now, I know all of you that do transcranial don't do monitoring, but um, hopefully this will be helpful for those who do. So we're going to talk about continuous monitoring. It's best to have um, dedicated systems when you're doing continuous monitoring, just because if you are using the imaging systems, you're going to have to hold that bulky probe the whole time. The imaging companies have not yet developed any head fixation device for their probes, just because their probes are large and you need a very small probe to, um, you know, to use a fixation device. And I'm going to show you some of the, um, the pictures of this. The main vessel that we monitor in with, with TCD is the middle cerebral artery, and there are CPT codes now for this, luckily. So and we, they're kind of procedure codes. So these are the TCD monitoring codes. And I, I kind of call them procedure codes because we're doing a procedure. So we've done our basic TCD evaluation, looking at the temporal bone, looking through the orbit of the eye, and through the foramen of magnum. Now we're going to go on and do something a little bit addition to that. And so the, the reimbursement people will allow us to charge for literally two studies, your complete study that you do, and then co-report it with your procedure that you do. So the 93890 is for reactivity. So vasomotor reactivity we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, 93892 is when you're looking for emboli and you're not doing an injection. This would be if someone comes in, they have a, let's say, a vegetative heart valve. The um, echo showed that they're having TIAs. If we continuously monitor the middle cerebral arteries for, say, a half an hour, they recommend an hour, um, and you hear emboli, you can pretty much 
99% be positive that's coming from that vegetative valve, that it is a cardioembolic phenomenon. So that's when you would use this um, CPT code. The final code is 93893. Now this is for emboli with microbubble injection, and this code is used for patent foramen of alley. So if we're looking for that hole in the heart and that right to left shunt, this is when we would use this code. Again, you want to co-report all your procedure codes. So we're going to do a complete study, a 93886, do a complete circle of Willis evaluation, and then do your procedure code. The billing people will understand what you're talking about when you say, I want to co-report this code with this code. And you will get paid for two studies, and it can be done on the same day. Um, it's not like other procedures that we can't do two things at the same day. You can, you can do both of these on the same day. Now, billable indications for this. So you remember, there's billable and there's not billable. There's non-billable. So billable indications would be a microembolic event. Now, people call them MEES, which that's what it stands for, microembolic event. Or you hear the verbiage HITS, which stands for high intensity transient signals. So microembolic events are all a billable indication with TCD. The patent foramen of valley we just talked about a few minutes ago. This is when we would look for emboli following the agitated saline injection that we would give. Okay, so another billable indication is for carotid endarterectomies. This took Chuck Tegler and the boys in, from neuro um, from the neuro group years and years to get this code approved for endarterectomy. But you can get paid for carotids now in the operating room. Um, another indication is for vasomotor reactivity. Now this would be if a patient has, say, a carotid disease that's very, very hemodynamic to the brain and you want to um, you want to see if the vessels in the brain are maximally dilated or not. So vasomotor reactivity can be done with CO2, it can be done with Diamox, which we'll talk about all these, and breath holding. Now non-billable indications. They will not allow us to bill for cardiac procedures. A lot of people monitor high-risk cardiac procedures just for patient you know, patient care. Say they've got bilateral carotid occlusions and they want to make sure that the brain is being perfused when we're on pump. But we still can't bill for these. So you have to kind of go in the back door and get around these by just charging for a complete TCD before the procedure and then maybe the next day or charge for, charge for another complete TCD. That's kind of how we get around that. Carotid stent placement, we Cannot, you cannot bill for these. Interventional procedures, even though we do a lot of these, such as test balloon occlusion or TBO, um, again, they are not billable. It's a non-billable indication. Okay, more non-billable indications, cardiac ablations. I've monitored a lot of these. There's a lot of emboli that go up into the brain during these. And um, again, you just can't, you don't get re Positional, positional flow changes, if you have, um, let's say we have a patient that needs to have a, a tilt table done just because when they stand up real quick they become, you know, dizzy and they pass out. So the tilt table indication, you put them on the tilt table, monitor the middles when you elevate the table so many degrees. You do not get paid for these just because it's, um, it's, not, it's not a reimbursable indication. Okay, so MCA, um, again, we monitor in the middle. You want to get the M1 segment on there. You try not to get the anterior cerebral artery on there, um, just the MCA. And I like to monitor, again, remember these depths are according to, to head size, but I like to monitor at like 50 to 56 um, 
to 50 to 56 millimeters from skin surface in. Use the middle window if you can. Now, you can use other windows, but I'm telling you it's very difficult to do. So this is the best window. So you want to have a good window. Otherwise, if you have a posterior window, your ear is going to get in the way here. So the probe is the probe holder it looks like that eyeball, and I'll show you this in a few minutes, but it's big and it goes over the ear and you don't have good skin integrity. So you must try to use that middle window. The anterior window you'd think would be okay, but you've got the orbit of the eye, and um, let me get my little arrow here. You've got the orbit of the eye here that, um, that gets in the way of that probe. Okay, so this is this is the this is the um, fixation device that we use. Most of the companies they all look like this. They're just different variations of that. But it looks like a surgeon's headlight. Um, you want to. It has a, in the back here. It has a strap that looks like your your baseball cap. So you can adjust it to the patient's head size. Um, this part of the head piece you want to have up high. The biggest mistake people make is having it low on the eyebrows here. So you want to have it up higher on this part of your forehead. So up up above up above the eyebrows, right about in here. So and there's also a velcro strap that goes across. I don't always use these, but you can attach it and just leave it loose until you get this thing on and then tighten it up to secure it. This is important. You want to have the back part of this head holder low on the occiput here, below the occipital area. If it's up too high, they slide right up off the head. So you want to have it low above the shoulders, as low as you can get it. And then have this, again, on the top, above the forehead, um, right about in this area. And tighten your tighten your your knob here, like your surgeon's headlight. Tighten this crank down um, last, and get that thing on there good. Now you want to um, take. I think the next slide I have this lightened up. So this whole thing right here is a little slide. It's like it allows you to slide this back and forth to get into your window. This big knob here, this black knob, this tightens. It's, I call it the window knob, so it kind of tightens and keeps you in your window. This little knob here, I don't know if you can see it, it's blue. Um, tight, this is your fine tuner, so loosen both of these up. And we've got our probe in here. Use your joystick and find your window, find, find your, um, a real good window, find a real nice signal. And tighten your black knob first to keep you in the window and then tighten this tiny little blue knob next, holding your probe the whole time. Okay, so you want to make sure you've got a hold of that joystick so that you don't lose your signal. So remember little tricks. Remember knob, your knob here to nose, and this knob here to nose. These, these um, eyeballs here, they have a left and a right. So. Remember, knob to nose. If you have this on the other side, this knob is going to be back by the ear, and you're not going to be able to tighten that up because the ear is going to get in the way. So if you use a little crutch of this knob to nose and this knob to nose, or you can label these right and left. A lot of people just marker them or put a little um, you know, label on here that says R and L so you know which one's right and left. And again, the Velcro strap you can use. Some people use it, but some people don't. It's just, it varies on what you feel comfortable with. Now, we're going to go into um, just setting up the, the software, the, you know, setting it up so that you have your monitoring on your screen for you. So to start our exam, we're going to do our complete exam first, and then we're going to go into patient, patient, and then we're going to either go into new patient, or if you've done a complete already, you will select the patient from your list here. And you hit OK, and then we're ready to continue. Okay, 
So now this is the part that's important. A lot of people, they go into patient, and now they're ready to go into their next little file here that says set up. Set up, and then we've got display, monitoring, protocols. You would think because we're monitoring that you want to go into monitoring. You do not. Do not choose monitoring. You want to go into display. Display is going to change the look of our display. So think about this. It, it's going to change the display on the screen. Okay, so go into setup. Do not go into monitoring. Go into display. And what display will give you is this next screen. It's going to say, okay, what do you want to do? Here's monitoring. Do you want to do unilateral monitoring, bilateral monitoring standard, or do you want to do unilateral hits, bilateral hits? We're going to talk about breath holding and VMR. Again, this tells you, what do you want to do? Do you want to go into unilateral or bilateral breath holding, unilateral or bilateral VMR? When you're done with your monitoring study to go back into diagnostic, which is what we were in, you have to go into set up display and check off this diagnostic unilateral again, okay? Otherwise, it's going to default to the monitoring that we were using. Okay, so let's start our exam here. We're going to remember to add your vessel label. When this comes up, when this, when this screen comes up, so we're doing monitoring now. When this screen comes up, you're going to see right middle, left middle, but right here, this is going to say none. So it doesn't label these vessels for you. You have to tell the machine, I want my right middle here and my left middle here. To do that, you either click the word none or you go into vessel and it'll let you pick a, pick a vessel, right middle or left middle. Okay, up here on the upper right hand screen, it's going to have um, the M mode is what we use for monitoring. In the lower part of our screen here is this thing that says hits here. There's a drop down menu. You can either have hits, which is going to tell you how many emboli you have. Emboli are orange, artifact are blue. Or you can use this drop down and it'll say trends. So you can either change this to emboli or to trends. And that again is on the lower portion of our screen. So trends is just going to give you your mean flow and whatever you, else you want to monitor. It's not going to give you any hits on there. Okay, so now we've done all that and you save one of these and you figure, okay, I'm ready to go now. You have to hit the record button here. So if I get a nice, I have my right middle, my left middle, I have a nice tracing on there. Um, I've got a nice M mode. I know that this is my middle because um, I've got flow clear out here distal in the 40s. I've got my hits going on. I'm going to select this button here that says baseline. And you think you're ready to go because you hear this flow and you think it's recording. You have to hit start record, which is right here. If you don't hit that, you're not going to be recording anything. I get a lot of calls from people that say, you know, we went in and we, we thought we, were, we had everything going and it didn't record anything. And I'm like, well, did you hit the record button? And they're like, well, we thought we did, but we didn't. So remember that when you are recording, this button is green. When you stop recording, it's going to turn red again. Okay, so it's red before you start. Now it's green because we are now recording. The equipment is recording everything for you. It's saving all your emboli for you. It's saving your artifact for you. Um, it's saving all of your tracings and saving your sound. Okay, so let's say we're done with our um, examination. Now we're going to um, print our exam. Now, if you just go into this button here and pull your study up, you go patient and you load, load your patient up, and if you just hit print, it's going to print you nothing but numbers and times. It means nothing. You literally have to select the events that you want printed out. So you have to go over here into this event, 
list, and you can either just select events all, or you can select I only want hits. You can select I only want predefined events. I only want artifact. You can tell it what you want to print. And then you just highlight your event, and you have to hit save down here. And you repeat this. I want this hit, and then I'm going to save it. I want this hit, and I'm going to save it. It sounds painful, but it's, it gives you more information than you're just, you're just going to, otherwise you're just going to get um, another, another um, just a whole page full of numbers. Okay, so you have to select it and then hit save. And I have a um, bigger picture of this. So you see up here where it says um, events up here and then predefined. So again, you would hit um, into your event and then hit save. Okay. Okay. So then once you go into the word print, so let me show you where that is on the previous page, right here. On the previous page it says print. So once you've done, I want this and I'm going to save it. I want this event and then I'm going to save it. I want this one, and I'm going to save it. And then when you hit the print button, it takes you into this screen. So now it's going to have everything you saved lined up here. And they're all going to be checked. And you're, it's going to be select all or deselect all. So I would say select all because you already selected them. And all you have to do then is hit OK down here and then it's going to print your pictures for you. Okay, so the doctors are literally going to have a picture to see rather than just numbers. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about microembolization, which I, I think you've probably already had a talk on it, but I quickly wanna review. Okay, so Every vessel, as you guys know, have many layers. The, um, this, is a, this is a normal um, vessel lining here. When you have, when you have bifurcations, such as um, the internal, external bulb kind of bifurcation, you have the eddy currents that occur in there. When you have genus, which is nothing but a bend in the road, so you've got a, you've got a, you've got a, a windy, vessel. You can have eddy currents that build up and they eventually break down the, the lining here. The body senses this and it tries to repair the lining by um, putting little platelets on there to try and patch it. It's like a band-aid. And then eventually you get fibrin sticking to it, you get red blood cells sticking to it, and you end up with, um, with a mess. Okay, so you end up with something that can look like this. If you have high cholesterol, you're going to get plaque. Okay, so that's how we get that. You can get, here's, a, here's some platelets. You can get some little platelet thrombi in there. You can get a thrombus that forms in there from the RBC. And then you can have distal embolization that will lead to a thrombus occlusion. Okay, so this is a carotid that I did in the office setting, actually. And you can see the ulceration here, and you can see we took this patient then into the operating room and did an endarterectomy um, on him. And when they opened this up, this was like tapioca pudding. It was really, really ugly. Um, but he was, having, he was having emboli from this, from this plaque. You can see how ugly it is inside of there. Okay, common sites for plaque. You can see what I'm talking about. Here's the genu. When we do the siphon, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for disease in this in this bend of the of the road here. Also a genu here 
in the vertebral artery before it turns into the basilar at the vertebral basilar junction. Um, embol or plaque sites here, we talked about the internal and external bifurcation. The aortic arch, they don't have it because this is brain. They weren't thinking about that. But any time you have bends in the road, you're going to have um, plaque formation. And plaque can form emboli. Okay, also, we talked about cardiac a little bit. You can have a vegetative valve, which is what this is right here. Um, and it will send emboli up into the brain. Artificial valves, whether they be porcine, mechanical, any artificial valve or a valve that is damaged can cause emboli that go into the brain. I will tell you that the porcine valves do not embolize as much as your um, artificial valves here. People that are in atrial fibrillation, they also embolize. You can hear them, I mean, and even though they're anticoag, you can sometimes hear them. You have to listen for a long period of time when you're looking at your fibro patients, because they're real hard to pick up. And these emboli are soft emboli, so they're not emboli that I'm going to be playing for you, because that one's a PFO, but they're not loud emboli. They're little, tiny, chirpy emboli that you really, really have to listen for um, very carefully and, um, and see them and hear them. Okay, so microemboli can be called mes or hits. We can, with transcranial, detect solid or gaseous. We cannot differentiate between the two. Every manufacturer in the world is trying to um, differentiate the composition of these emboli, but at this time, we cannot do that. The size of the emboli is 30 to 50 microns as far as the sensitivity. Now, what does that mean? If you take one, one red blood cell is 10 microns. So if you take three red blood cells, clump them together, throw them past the TCD beam, it is going to say that is foreign, that should not be there. So it has a greater reflectivity as well. So you're going to have a higher harmonic. The harmony is greater than 10 decibels. So it doesn't sound like the swishy sound we're used to with, an, with the RBC. So it, you have that shh, shh sound and then all of a sudden you have a little bloop, bloop a higher emboli, or higher amplitude coming from an emboli. Now this is the PFO movie. Let me see if this is going to show up here. Okay, I'm going to, again, this is a patent frame in a valley we did, we did um, inject with this. So let's see if we can get this to play. You're going to hear the emboli. Remember, blue are artifact, orange are emboli. So that's artifact there, that's an embolus. These are all emboli. You hear the harmonic quality it has to that and the differentiation between the emboli and the, um, and the artifact. Artifacts don't travel, so they usually sit on the, on the baseline. Why it beamed ahead. Hi, Donnelly. Just select the one that says webinar December. Okay. And we should be back. Okay, I'm sorry. I was hitting the wrong one. Oh, I was confused. <laughs> okay. I apologize, people. Okay. Limitations. Thank you, Erin, so much. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so limitations. You cannot determine the composition of the emboli. Like I say, everybody in the whole world wants to say, well, that was a plaque. Well, no, that was a fibrin platelet. That was a thrombus. You cannot determine what they are. We just know they're there. And you cannot tell the size of these emboli. They're, they're 30 to 50 microns. That's all we know. And unless they're completely occluding off the the M2 segment, um, you really can't say how big they are. 
All right, so now we're going to talk about um, vasomotor reactivity. Applications are arterial venous malformations, which um, are the, the nesting type of web artery, fistula type of things that occur in the brain and in the spinal cord. The other application is cerebrovascular disease, and that's really, really big right now um, with stroke, all the comprehensive stroke centers coming up. So if you have someone that has a carotid lesion like we talked about earlier, um, and it's hemodynamically significant, and you wonder, well, have the, are the vessels in the brain, have they dilated up to where they can't protect this patient anymore? Um, the, these simple reactivity testing, these physiologic testings that we can do, will determine a patient at high risk for acute stroke. So it, the VMR and the breath holding especially is very, very popular right now in these big stroke centers. The other application for vasomotor reactivity is head injury. So if you have someone that's got massive, massive head injuries, the vessels, and we're not going to talk about this, but it's in a trauma lecture, but you think about the vessels in the brain, it, the, the, it's a chemical synaptic, synaptic occurrences that allows our vessels to constrict and dilate. If you've had such severe head trauma that these vessels cannot do this, they lose their ability to autoregulate and they just passively open up and they become huge. We call it the stiff pipe syndrome in head injury. And there's nothing we can do about it. You can't reverse it. The vessel just is, is, is as wide and as big as it's going to get, and that's because the, the body can't vasoconstrict it. So that's a, it's a very bad sign when you see disorder regulation in the trauma world. Okay, reactivity agents, we have carbon dioxide, which is CO2. Acetazolamide is a, is a pharmacologic um, drug that we can give that um, artificially simulates um, vasodilatation. And you can also do a simple breath holding test, which again, we're going to talk about all three of these. Okay, so we have a CPT code for, for this. The 93890 is our reactivity study code. And again, we co-report it with a complete exam. So you would, and I can't stress this enough because you know, if you just do the reactivity or the emboli and don't, and you don't submit it with anything else, you're not going to get paid for it. They want to see that you did a complete TCD examination and then you did your procedure, okay? So I know it's a little more work for us, but we're getting paid for two studies and the patient is getting very, very good care. I mean, it's giving us a good standard of care here. So do your 93886 and then co-report it with the 93890. Okay, so let's talk about the breath holding index, which again, this is very, very popular. The doctors are doing it in their doctor's office. And um, it's simple and easy to do. It's just, well, it sounds simple to do, but, you know, it's hard to hold your breath for 30 seconds or longer um, unless you're a swimmer or a marathon runner. Let's first of all talk about the Sonara and the Sonara Tech, um, the setup. How do, we, how do we get this on our screen? And from talking about monitoring, you know we're going to change the display on our screen. So we're going to go into Patient. And then we're going to pick either a new exam or we're going to select a patient, okay? Again, you probably already did a complete study, so you're probably just going to be selecting from the list. Then we go into Setup, and then we choose Display. And Display is going to take us to where we want to do breath holding. You do not have to do breath holding bilateral. A lot of people do. It takes longer to put the headband on than it does um, to um, do the exam itself, but a lot of people do bilateral rather than unilateral. If you're going to do it unilaterally, you want to do it on the side where the lesion is. So let's say we have a left carotid lesion. You're going to want to look at the left middle cerebral artery. 
let's say we have a right MCA um, stenosis. Look at the right middle cerebral artery and see if your flows increase with your increased PCO2 levels. Okay, so again, remember when we're done doing our examinations, you want to go back in and get the machine ready for diagnostics tomorrow because you got to go do some spasms in the morning. Go in to set up display and change it back to unilateral diagnostic. Otherwise, the machine's going to be preset to the breath holding that we did this evening before we left. Okay. So, again, we're going to go up here. You see, for some reason, they don't have the breath holding mode up there. It presets to the M mode. You can see. So, if you go up into this drop down arrow here, you want to change it to BH test. That means breath holding test. That's going to give you a start and a stop, a start and a stop, a little box up there. Now you see here, it has none. Remember I told you in the monitoring where you have to put in right middle and left middle, okay? Right now it says none. If you click into that word none, it'll give you your drop down menu of the, what vessel you wanna pick. Or you can go into vessel and it will also give you that same drop down menu, okay? But remember to do this. These are just little things that I have forgotten to do many, many times, and I'm, I'm just giving you a little heads up. It's, it's kind of just simple, simple things that once you start doing them, you get used to it, and it's like second nature. Okay, so you see now we have the start and the stop. Okay, so this is, these are the windows they're gonna give you. Now you see right here, we've got a little clock down here. This is nice. If I can have the machine turn towards the patient so they can see it a little bit, they can watch the clock. If they cannot see it, I just kind of, I coach them. I say, come on, you've got 15 seconds in, we wanna to try to get to 30. Um, so let, you know, and, and you just kind of give them some encouragement to help them. Now, it's important to tell the patient not to take a deep breath. So I instruct the patient two things. Don't take a deep breath before you hold your breath. I want you to just stop breathing. When you have to breathe, I want you to raise your hand for me and let me know you're going to breathe. The reason for that is the patients, even though they're breathing, I want you to continue to monitor for at least 10 to 15 more seconds, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you why that, that's important to do. Here's the other thing that's important to do. When you have your, when you have your um, nice tracings on there, you, you hit your start breath holding here and then start recording. If you do not hit your red record button, you're not gonna record this, even though you start your breath holding up here. This has a little start breath holding. That's going to tell the machine, it's going to tell the computer to give us this line. This is my baseline here, because you press that button. You have to hit record or it's not going to do it, okay? It doesn't automatically know. It can't read your mind. Okay, have the patient raise their hand when they're breathing. Again, when they are breathing, even though they're breathing, I want you to keep recording before you stop. Okay, because the flows are going to continue to increase. This is very important. The biggest mistake people make when they're doing these breath holding exams is when the patient starts to breathe, they stop. Well, I'm gonna play a video for you and hopefully I'll be able to get back into the um, session this time without messing up. That's gonna show you exactly what happens whenever um, we do a breath holding exam. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna hopefully start doing this. Okay. So here is where they, this is our baseline. This is where they started holding their breath. And you see how flows drop at first. This is very, very common. Very, very common. This next dip right here Uh, not yet, they're still holding their breath. They're still holding their breath. 
you see this next dip coming up right in here is when they started to breathe. But look what happens to our flows. They went from 76, they're still climbing, up to 80, up to 86, up to 87. Uh, and you see how the flows continued to increase even though the patient had started to breathe. Very, very important to do this. Okay, let me get back into the right one here. We'll just skip. Okay. So now, so we we know to do that now. So let's say we want to we don't like what we saved. We screwed up a little bit. When we hit stop breath holding, we stopped it too soon. So you want to hit start breath holding, and then whenever those flows get at the highest, then you hit stop breath holding down here. If you go into patient and load your exam, because you're going to review your exam, you can manipulate this line here. So I can take a, a little bar and I can move it over to where I, let's say I wanted this to be here. I can move this bar over to here and hit start breath holding. Then I can move this this yellowish bar over to where I want and then hit stop breath holding. And it's going to change these pictures for you and it'll change these numbers down here. Okay? So you can manipulate this data once you've done these exams. And you can actually do this even with vasomotor reactivity, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Now, this is the easy thing. You don't have to do that save and, you know, pick your event and save like we did in monitoring. This, you get what you want, and you have to be happy with this. And then you go up into this print button here, and you just hit print. And it prints this whole screen out for you. And down here, it gives the doctor the data. How long did the patient hold their breath? What is the breath holding index? The breath holding index in this software is the same that was published in the JAMA article, this article right here. Um, the April 26th of 2000, it was published. The breath holding index is greater than or equal to 0 0.69. Okay, let's talk about reactivity for a few minutes and um, then we're going to complete the presentation after we talk about Diamox. This is a CO2 tank that has 5 to 6% CO2 in it. This is a rebreather mask that we use. Um, you can get respiratory therapy to get this for you. They will do that. You just have to ask them. Again, you go into patient, new exam or select, go into setup, and you change it to VMR testing, whether it be unilateral or bilateral. Okay, so you want to change your M mode. This is what it's preset to. You want to change it to vasomotor reactivity mode, and that's going to give you three different boxes here. I think I show that on the next slide here. Yeah, you have a baseline, a maximum, and a minimum velocity. Again, you have your lines, baseline, maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum. You can manipulate these just like I told you. When we do this, you have to remember to hit start record, okay? So there's the start button that you want to hit start. I don't know if it's on this last slide here. Let me see. No, it's not. Okay. So um, you want to have them breathe in three to five minutes of CO2, and then you want to remeasure, and then you have them hyperventilate for three to five minutes. I know that sounds like a long time. A lot of your elderly people do not tolerate this. Remember, again, to label your vessel up here because this is going to say none. Young people um, tolerate it a little more than elderly. Kids, forget it. You cannot use the CO2 on them. They just don't do well. The West Coast does more VMR than the East Coast. If you have um, good reaction, you're going to have, um, you're going to have a greater than and this is just showing you how this increases. You're going to have a greater than 50% increase of your mean flow velocities. So it's kind of a greater than or less than 50%. So it's kind of easy to remember that. 
Um, when we go to print out this exam, we're going to go into patient down here and then load. Um, and then you're going to, again, edit if you have to change these lines. And then all you do is hit this print button here. And it's going to give everything the doctor needs, okay? All the information he or she needs. All right, Diamox is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It's a vasodilator. It increases blood flow velocity. You can't use it with sulfa allergies. You cannot use it if people have a renal or a um, liver disease. This is a drug that I love. We use it a lot in trauma. We used it in the kiddos um, because they sure as heck aren't going to hold their breath and they don't do face masks. They rip it right off and throw it at you. So um, Diamox is a real good drug to use for the kiddos. And there's really not a lot of side effects. The tinnitus and the tingling of the extremities, I've really never seen. People mainly just have to go to the bathroom um, when it's all through, when it's all said and done. But look at the onset of action, two minutes. Within two minutes, the Diamox works, and it only lasts 30 minutes. So you give it, and it's out of the system within a half an hour. So it's quick and easy to use. If you have a less than 10% increased mean flow velocity, it means the vessels are huge. They're already maximally dilated. They can't get any bigger. We can't do anything more than what we're doing. So um, that's, a, that's a definite compromise in vasomotor reserve. So here's an example. Here's a middle cerebral artery pre at 54, and you see within 10 minutes it dropped up. It flew up to 151. And this patient definitely had a lot of VMR reserve. Okay, so in conclusion, TCD is effective in evaluating cerebrovascular reserve. You can use CO2 inhalation. Again, some people feel like they're suffocating, they don't like hyperventilating, they get dizzy. You can't use this in kids or real elderly people. Diamox is um, a fairly benign drug that we can use, um, and you have your breath holding that you can use. Okay, so um, that wraps it up, and we've got 10 minutes for questions. I thank you so much for um, joining us, and um, if you ever want to have on-site transcranial Doppler training, I come to you. You can visit me on, on my website at www.tcdedu.com, um, or you can call me or, um, or email me. Now I'm going to turn over to Katie Valrath. Um, the presentation for moderation of the question and answers. And again, thank you so much for your time. Well, Donna Lee, thank you for that lovely presentation. I know we're going to have a lot of questions, and I'm going to uh, encourage uh, those of you that are listening today to use your chat box, and uh, you can send your questions to the uh, host and presenter. At that point, the presenter would be me, and I will uh, read your questions to Donna Lee, and she will answer them. Um, but uh, Donna Lee, so um, we already have a few questions that have come in. Okay. Um, the first one, I'm going to prompt you a, a little bit here. Um, the question was from Gwen in Florida. Can the saved images be labeled? So, you know, I, what comes to my mind, and I'll let you expand on this, would be the uh, predefined event list and then take a, a, a saved photo of that, but I'll let you take it from there. Well, that's what I would do. If I wanted to, if I wanted to, you know, specific, I don't think you can, we, I don't, Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you can um, change, like you can't type in anything you want. Um, correct, you, correct. So you, that's why I would use, I would go to setup, monitoring, events, and then predefined, predefined. events. Predefined. Mm -hmm. And put yeah. in anything, uh, Gwen, that you might want to label uh, ahead of time, and that way whenever you see that, you can just click on it uh, and it will be saved in your trend and then take a saved picture also. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, on monitoring, if a single hit is detected within a 30-minute time period, can it, might it just have been artifacts is the question. Well, the, I'm just going to tell you normal. Normal um, 
for emboli is zero. That's the normal number. Nobody should have emboli. Now, to differentiate whether it's artifact or an embolus truly, you have to look at the waveform and listen, replay the waveform. It has to have that high harmonic. You don't want to have it sitting on the baseline because remember, if it's on the baseline, the artifactual blip is on the baseline, that means it's not traveling. The embolus has to be enveloped in that waveform, which is the part of the cardiac cycle. So and you, it has to have a higher harmony. It can't be scratchy or a low, I mean, it can be still low if it's a soft embolus from, say, a heart valve. But artifacts are very scratchy. They're non-harmonic. All right. Thank you, Donnelly. Um, you ready for the next one? Yes. <laughs> we have a question from Tawana. She's asking, can you go into a completed study and continue to take additional waveforms for a basic TCD? Can you go into an additional study? I think she's asking if once you've loaded your study, can you add to the exam? The answer no. would be no. Right. Absolutely not. You have to go in and start, start a new one. I mean, even if the plug gets pulled, somebody walks past and I'm in the middle of an exam and somebody pulls out the plug and I start again, I have to do, I have to add to the last exam. It won't let you add to it. Okay. And I, I would agree with that. All right. Um, here's one. How can I get paid for my time? when performing a non-billable procedure, such as you mentioned a tilt table. How do I get paid for that? You know, the only way you can get paid for that is to do your complete exam and then do the tilt table and follow it up either the next morning or do another complete exam. There's, there's really, that's the only way you can go in the back door is to just charge for a complete and then follow it up the next day post-procedure, and that's how the doctor would dictate it. This is post-procedure tilt table um, day number one or whatever. So that's kind of how we've always done it, and it's worked well. I mean, we've never had anything rejected using that method. All right, uh, let's see. My doctor wants us to uh, evaluate the basilar artery for emboli. How can I use the headgear for that? You can't. <laughs> um, if you're looking at a basilar artery, you have to hold it. There's no way around it, and it's painful because I've done it. Um, hopefully, you have uh, some some sonographers that will help you out. You know, take do shifts. Get, I'll do 10 minutes. You do 10 minutes, and then I'll come back and do 10 minutes. It's really how you have to do it because you cannot use the head holder. I mean, unless you know something that I don't know, Katie. If there's any additional um, devices, apparatuses that you can add on to the headband we have. I don't know. No, all you can do is hand hold it, as uh, Donna Lee said, and you know, you really have to make sure that ergonomically you get yourself into a comfortable, appropriate position. So if the patient is, you know, lying supine, make sure that you really brace your arm because there is no uh, holder that can uh, stay in place for the uh, basilar artery. Yeah, you want to lay it like you want to sit at the head of the bed, have the patient lay on their side so that your whole arm is rested and just monitor that way. I mean, that's the best way. Very good. You, you can't do it sitting up. I'm telling you, it's just too hard. You just get exhausted. Um, this one, Donnelly, is from Jade. Can you leave the monitoring screen? and return to a complete, uh, or in other words, a diagnostic screen to co-report the two exams together without losing exam data. No. Yeah. <laughs> so I think what's important here is that we have a, a diagnostic exam and then we have a monitoring um, exam, and you must go in and choose which one you're doing each time, as Donna Lee uh, described so nicely. So uh, you couldn't go back and forth. Um, Jade, I hope that we're answering your question. 
Um, we're running a little bit short on time here, but Donnelly, we've got time for just a few more. Okay. Um, let me just sort through these. Well, what if the patient can't hold their breath for 30 seconds when you're doing breath holding? You know, you just have to let the doctor know that they, however many seconds they were able to hold it, and it'll be the physician's determination of, well, was this good enough, or do I need to, you know, resort to maybe CO2 or maybe, you know, try it a little bit of Diamox. It'll, that'll be the physician's call, but just let them know that they could only hold their breath 20 seconds. And, you know, look at the flow changes, and if, you know, it'll just be their call. There is no, there is no set there is no set protocol for that, let me put it that way. So you mentioned Diamox. We've got a caller that would like to know, under what circumstances do you choose um, breath holding versus CMR versus Diamox? Well, that's a prime example is what I was just telling you. A patient can't hold their breath. You know, we had a little girl that had um, Moya Moya, and you know, we could not, we could, she would not keep the face mask on to do, first of all, she couldn't hold her breath. We tried that, that was futile. And then we tried to use the CO2, she wouldn't keep the face mask on. So we just went with a half a gram of Diamox and, and gave it to her. That would be one instance that any child, pediatric, and the trauma world, we usually always use the Diamox because most of them are intubated and, um, you know, unresponsive, they can't, they can't help you out there. So it would be those kind of instances, people that just can't hold their breath. Very good. One last question. Are you up to that, okay. Donnelly? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, this one was regarding coding. Um, you say that the, uh, the uh, emboli monitoring codes must be co-reported with a diagnostic probe. Uh, does that have to be a complete study, or what if uh, you just, what if the MD just wanted you to, to look at the uh, MCAs bilaterally? It has to be a complete study. They're real sticklers about this. They want to make sure a complete circle is done before you do your procedure code. And you cannot do a limited. It'll get, they'll get knocked out. Um, you cannot co-report with a limited exam. It has to be a complete exam. Um, so it, and because, I think it's because that the reimbursement people think of this as being a procedure. That's like when I talk about it, that's why I use the verbiage. It's a procedure that we're doing, and that's why they're paying for it additionally. Okay, well, Donna Lee, thank you, and, and folks, thank you for submitting those questions. I think they really helped answer some questions that uh, many people may have had. Um, at this point, then, we are um, just about done with our webinar um, this uh, time. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email me. I'm the TCD clinical specialist here. Um, although I go by the name Katie, my actual name is Katha, so don't make that mistake um, of sending the email to Katie, not Katha. And then our TCD product manager is Aisha Upal, and you could also uh, feel free to contact her if you have any questions. Again, Donna Lee, we thank you so much for uh, this lovely uh, webinar, and uh, thank everybody for joining us. And this will conclude. Pleasure, uh, thank you, Donnelly. So this will conclude the webinar for today. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.